Welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast. With your hosts, Travis, Jason, and our new friend, uh, Blaine. Uh, it's nice to meet you guys, uh, especially uh, being on this podcast. You know, nice to get our uh, name out there, you know. Yeah, I first met Blaine at uh, Chicago last year, the, the event where I took the golden tickets. So, you know, he's been chasing the competitive high ever since then, it seemed like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um... I uh I love the competitive scene of of different games and being able to scratch that competitive itch. Yeah, I mean we just saw each other at a Kill Team Open where I think your teammate on Six Sided Legion, your team did pretty well with um un- non meta team. Yeah, uh, he took I think twelfth with Kazarkin. So yeah. that's exciting. So Jason, that's that's your uh, that's your <laughs> that's your high tier brother right there. Yep, I've I've kind of been noodling around with Kasserkin a bunch locally, but uh haven't I haven't brought him to any big events or anything. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, both of you are in the Midwest region. Although yes, we're the both... Midwest region is a questionable region from what I understand. <laughs> uh we're both from Wisconsin. Um here in Wisconsin, it's like you've got a tiny scene in Madison and a little bit in Milwaukee, but the biggest part is Chicago for sure. Nothing else like any anywhere north of that. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm in Minnesota. We've got a, like, pretty much the Twin Cities, we've got a pretty decent scene. Uh, we had a tournament very recently that had 16 players, which was cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish I could get that kind of size here, but I, I just don't know if it would ever, would ever be possible. Yeah, you guys out in, because uh, I met you in Chicago, I think your entire came out to visit in Chicago, right? Uh, yes. But not three everyone was, was playing at the time? Three of us played. One of us didn't have... Uh, he only had two compendium teams at the time and wanted to get like a feel for the competitive like stuff mm-hmm. before trying it. So, And you guys have been traveling out ever since then, basically, right? You were at LVO, at KTO, and I yeah. assume you're going to do a couple more events this year. Yeah, so like I, like I mentioned before we started this, uh, I tried to look into doing Adepticon. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get tickets for the championships. Uh, we're still looking into getting tickets for the doubles, at least. That way we can at least go and check it out and try to you know, play some Kill Team over that weekend. But um, And then possibly Nova. Uh, I still have to talk to the guys about that one. Um, but we've never been to that one, so it'd be kind of cool to, to check that one out. And then maybe even the uh, the New York Open in November with you. So, Jason, are you heading to Adepticon this year? Yeah, um, I'm not going to the Grand championship either um i'm going to be working that sunday unfortunately but i am planning to go for the doubles there's a friend of mine we're gonna go uh bring some elf shenanigans looks like it's probably gonna be hand of the archon and harlequins being the menacing oh. duo that we're gonna go noodle around with <laughs> oh man you guys are gonna frustrate people to no end <laughs> that sounds terrible <laughs> yeah did so, you did you have any trouble uh buying tickets because i know that between nova and adepticon they're on the older side of the events so sometimes the ticketing process is a little sketchy for these older events yeah i've been to adepticon um i went last year for uh as we call it big hammer and uh adepticon is always confusing just to like navigate the website and and like because like it's not like super easy and obvious to find out where the ticket sales are and then like you have to blow out this like giant list and then like go find the filters to it's yeah it's you gotta they make you work for it. And Blaine, you ran into this issue? Uh, I did. So at first, I tried looking probably a week after we got back from KTO, and I could not, for the life of me, figure out where to go for Adepticon. Uh, and then some people in the Discord helped me out a little bit. Um, and I finally navigated over to the championships, and they were sold out. And then registration had closed like the day before. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> So the the complicated maze of old websites has definitely been getting you getting people. I know locally my players who signed up for Nova, a lot of people there's a, a lot of comments talking about how do exactly do we buy tickets? What do I need to buy? Cuz I think I don't know if this is like this for Adepticon, but at least for Nova you have to buy a convention hall pass and then you can buy the tickets. And you're not allowed to look at the tickets until you've bought the first part. 
you said that's for Nova. That's for Nova. So, yeah. you know, for anyone listening who wants to go to Nova, which is later this year, make sure you get a convention hall ticket because you need access to the entire event and then you can buy your individual event tickets. So it's it's similar to LVO in that sense then. Yeah, I guess so. I haven't been to LVO, so I wouldn't know. Oh, okay. Yeah, so LVO was a, I think it was a $50 entry ticket like for admission, and then you could buy your individual event tickets afterwards. So, I see, I see. Yeah, how much is uh, Depticon this year? Like, what's the normal vibe? I've never actually been, so Jason, if you want to talk it up a little bit. Oh, you know, I actually already forgot. Uh, I feel like it was, I feel like it what was, was it like $50? Uh, when I looked, uh, I think the price was like forty two. It was something weird. Like it wasn't an like a an exact like dollar amount. Yeah, clean number. That sounds that yeah. sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you can. Hopefully, part of the Six Hundred Legion can get into doubles. So, do you yeah. know who's running doubles? Is it going to be the same I, TO as the uh, Golden Ticket event? I don't know because, like I said, we emailed them for the the championships and stuff. And they answered almost right away. And then we uh, messaged them for doubles, and nobody's answered yet. So I think it's something or somebody different. I would assume. Yeah, that's that's unfortunate. Hopefully, you guys get it because doubles is certainly a lot of fun. Yeah, and this is like a weird format of doubles. It's it's literally like there's an open board. So this is what it sounds like. It sounds like there's an open board and into the dark, and they're like joined. And then each player has Ooh. to have half your team in each, and you work together, and it's like a crazy four-player game that's all mashed together. Weird. That sounds very messy. Yeah, Adepticon always has like crazy stuff going on. That's like some like unique homebrew that only exists at Adepticon, and this is definitely some of that. I think was it Gen Con or Adepticon where someone had the McFarlane gene sealers with the jeans, the normal size gene sealers on their bases? Does anyone remember this? Is this just me? Uh I think it was a, I think it was Gen Con. Okay. I think I remember seeing a post about it. Yeah. Well, maybe he'll show back up for Adepticon for doubles. You know, he'll just take up the entire board. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, Blaine, tell us about your team. Like, what do you guys play? Because you guys are part of a very small scene, it sounds like. So it sounds like your core group is, I know you guys are all playing a lot, but which teams are you really into? What what parts of your tiny, like, group meta has impacted the wider meta when you guys go out to play? Yeah, so um, collectively, I know, and I had mentioned this in one of our, I think our KTO video, actually, uh, when we did that for our channel. Um, but collectively, we have every bespoke team except for Phobos. So we have a super wide range of teams that you know we can play. Um, personally, I started with Hunter Clade. Um, that was my first bespoke team, and then you know they got the buffs, and I took them to a, a couple events, and then I wanted to try something different, so I switched up to Blooded. Uh, I saw that you know Chris Baki and a few others were doing pretty well with them, so I wanted to try them out. Uh, and they were they were all right. They didn't give me as much you know luck as I wanted, but. They were still really fun. Um, and now I'm trying to kind of switch it up, try RBDs a little bit, uh, Exaction Squad that came out in Soul Shackle. Um, just because they, they seem interesting. They seem very different when it comes to the mechanics and such. Uh, you have to play them in a different way. Um, but if I could, you know, sometime in the future, get some competitive uh, experience with them, that'd be awesome. Um, otherwise, we've got Brett, who plays Kazrakin. He started on Warp Coven, so... Pretty big difference there, uh, and he's doing pretty well with Kazrakin so far. So you know, I don't know how he's doing it. <laughs> um, and uh, then we've got Nate uh, on Legionaries, and um, our buddy Ethan, who started on Compendium teams. Uh, he started with Tyranids and Death Guard, and he liked just the monstrous, like, kind of gross stuff. So he went to Gellerpox. And he's really liked Gellerpox ever since starting them. So we've got a pretty good array of like meta. Um, anytime we take them to a tournament, it's kind of weird because we see everything else that is in the meta. You know, Corsairs and Breachers and, uh, you know, the Intercession team and more uh, Legionaries. Like, just kind of everything. Uh, so it's kind of cool to be able to play with different people and play with different like play styles and stuff. Yeah, do you have any um like local play things that you guys do that you haven't seen people outside do? Um so not that I really know of. Um 
like I said uh, before, or I mentioned it before we started the the podcast here. Uh, I am kind of hosting like a little friendly uh, narrative tournament that you know we just wanted to try out narrative rules and such with the uh, teams. Um, outside of that, though, I don't think we're really doing much other than what's already going on on outside our region. Um, I'd really like to try to get more tournaments going on up in like the like Wisconsin, Chicago, Midwest area, but I know it's a lot of work to set that kind of stuff up. So Yeah, I mean Jason can speak to that a little bit in, in his area. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So um I mean I've been running kill team tournaments pretty much since it came out and the first like six months like it was very low attendance, very little engagement. And then uh, all of a sudden it kind of all popped off all at once and jumped up to like um, the first like big tournament that all of a sudden went well was 24 players. And uh, kind of one of the big things inside that engine, I've kind of I've mentioned it in other podcast episodes, but just kind of a quick thing um, was just like having a steady game night. So like every Monday at 6 p.m. we go hang out at the same store and it's super reliable and it makes it really easy and predictable for other people to jump on board with at their own convenience. Yeah. I think a uh, predictable and reliability at a local shop helps a ton. So if you do want to try to get something going, I, you've already have four people. So, you know, have you guys meet up at a shop, you know, once a week or once every two, two weeks it helps a lot. Yeah. But and it, then just it, like it the visibility, time. like you're out there playing games and then, like, other people walk by and they're like, oh, what's this cool looking terrain and models you've got here? And you're like, oh, it's Kill Team. And then, like, I don't know. I mean, we've had a fair few people that we just brought into the club 100% with that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I definitely see, like, the the viability of, of doing that kind of stuff. It's yeah. just when I, because I have reached out to the owner or, like, the the person who runs our LGS down here. And uh, or up here, I guess. Um, and uh, he had talked about how there weren't very many people who would be interested in Kill Team that he knew about. Uh, it's a lot of big war, uh, you know, Warhammer 40k and uh, AOS that they do at that store. But I mean, of course, just going there and playing and having people kind of walk by and see that kind of stuff uh, would probably help a, a ton. Yeah, I think locally, if you are looking for it, um, you should basically just ask them for the least popular day because every store owner is always looking for business. So one of the things that has helped for some of our other smaller scenes in New York is uh, talk to the shop owner and be like, which day are you guys not getting a lot of business and try to make that your day? Because then if people do start coming in, it also doesn't impact other events nearly as much. So That's fair. Yeah, yeah that's we had a I didn't battle... Really about. We had a Battletech group do that, and then we have... Digimon and a couple other card games that have all basically been picked up days that are not as popular with some of the other games because Friday is a lot of times taken up by Magic the Gathering. You know, Saturdays and Sundays is a lot of bigger 40k stuff, but like, you know, Monday, Tuesday, people aren't really like coming out. So it's like another way to like drive business. So that would be, if you're looking for a hook, that would probably be the way I would kind of help drive it. Cool. Yeah. I appreciate the, uh, the uh, advice there is that was something I didn't really think about. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, I don't know if Jason, Jason, if you did something similar, or you guys just picked a day cause it was like all mostly free, but it definitely has helped in New York at least. Yeah. It was kind of just like the stars aligned. I mean, I talked to a couple different uh, spots and then people were like, Oh, can we do Thursdays or whatever? But really like Mondays are the only day that I, so I like, this was kind of based around me. I found a place that, that worked for, for me and my Mondays um yeah and then you know it worked great but so, yeah, if you're trying to build it build that scene that would be i think that's has generally been good advice from what i've seen or you can be you could take the uh the socal region idea where you just drive to every single shop and you try to run in every <laughs> week yeah <laughs> i don't know how sustainable that one is yeah right. that's that would be a lot of travel for sure yeah, I uh, after after talking to Dakota and LVO and his whole approach of pretty much exactly that, I was like, oh, you know, we do have a lot of game stores, so I've kind of been trying to bounce around more. And I'm like, that's a lot. I feel like I feel like each one I want to get traction at. So I'm like, if I was gonna do that, I'd want to do like three straight months here, and then move to the next one and do like three three straight months or whatever. But I don't know. Maybe there's just more kill team traffic in general in SoCal. 
I think it does take it does take work. And luckily for him, he has a lot of individual stores that already had small scenes. So he was just kind of like helping to push them along, it seemed like. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, in the Midwest, it sounds like you guys are straight up growing the scene from whatever's left over the disgruntled 40K players <laughs> or people looking at like, you know, the other skirmish games are like, you yeah, know, maybe I should try something in GW for a little bit. Yeah. Starting from zero, posting in like the discords of other games and being like, you're you're you've been creeping on Warhammer 40k for like two years and haven't played yet. Well, Kill Team's your great little gateway. I think. Yeah, I know. Uh, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, I was just gonna say that uh, I know at my local game store here, um, the Kill Team stuff that is ordered and like you know in stock at the store does sell. So there are people who are buying it up and probably playing that I just don't know about. You know, or it's just forty k people wanting the models. I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really hard to get Casterkin for a while, from what I could tell, because every Imperial Guard player is like, I need these Casterkin. Oh yeah, and uh, I think it's similar to Soul Shackle here, because uh, people just want those those RBDs and Hand of the Archon models really bad, I guess. Yeah, it it has been hard to get Soul Shackle, so. I don't know. I think Jason, you got yours pretty pretty quickly, or you already had Drakari. Is that what yeah? It was? I already had Drakari, and I pretty much just like I was like, I've got a bunch of stuff. Let me like chop up some things and like um, for the Sky Splinter Assassin, I just took like a Cabalite Warrior, but I took one of the uh, one of the birds from the Chaos Knights and put him on his shoulder. And I was like, I actually like this more than the than the one in the actual kit. Yeah. Do uh, you guys I... have any interesting kit bashes? Um, I personally have kit bashed stuff before. Um, I, when I got my Wormblade team, I was not willing to spend, you know, thirty to forty dollars on every agent. Uh, so I kit bashed all of them except for the Sanctus sniper, or, yeah, the Sanctus. Uh, I bought the Sanctus and magnetized the arm, uh, and then I kit bashed the Locust and the Ke uh, Keller Morph just out of extra neophyte bits and uh, like admech stuff. They turned out really, really cool looking though. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's one of the cool things of the hobby is when you go to like a bigger event and you get to see all these other people who are like really excited to show off their teeny tiny plastic army men. <laughs> because oh, yeah. a lot of people put in a lot of energy into all of these basically like small things. So, yeah, I've put way too much effort into my Phobos where like pretty much like um, there's like a couple of different lieutenants in like Reaver armor, Phobos armor, whatever. And I've just like chopped them up and put extra bits from the upgrade sprue from the, um, uh, from the Phobos strike team. And, um, I got a box of Reavers and I put Reaver skulls on everyone, like the incursors, the infiltrators and the Reavers, just everyone's got the skull masks and just like chopping up a bunch of bits that don't belong. Uh, I have like my uh, incursor marksman is actually an eliminator, which I've seen a lot of people do that, and just is really an easy natural thing. Uh, the eliminators are like the sniper models with the capes. Damn. Yeah, my Phobos are Death Watch Phobos. They've got their they got their pads. Ooh, I like oh, that I, too. I love the Death Watch. That was yeah. my third, third or fourth team that I wanted to get, and I have them up on a shelf. Uh, three of them are kit bashed to look like. Uh, or have uh, a chaos, like different Chaos Marine armor, mm. and I'm just calling them like the redeemed Chaos Marines. Yeah, they're uh, uh, black shields, like that. right? Or... Yeah, the only one I need to do yet is uh, a Berserker. I was waiting on the new Berserker stuff to come out for that. So yeah, very cool. Yeah, I like that. So you were, I think we mentioned that your teammate was one of the oh. higher placing caster kid. Do you know if he does anything special that you know he's he'd be willing to let you leak on the internet? Uh, yes. Was, him and I have talked some about the Kazakhin stuff, and he, even at KTO, uh, just in the hotel one night, we switched teams so I could try to play Kazakhin against my blooded, um, just to see how, how to play him. And, you know, I did really poorly with him, of course. But, uh, you know, he he is all about, like, being very meticulous in how he spends his elite points. Um, and I know he's talked about it in like a couple blog articles and stuff before, but um, like if he's willing to to go out of his way to to make a shot against a high you know a high threat uh, model, something like a plasma gunner or like a a bigger elite unit like a maybe a acolyte from legionaries or something, uh, he's he's more willing to spend 
a majority of his elite points on that shot if it's going to count. Um, or if he can guarantee the kill. Because that's what elite points do. Is They don't make a bad shot a good shot. They make a good shot a guaranteed you know, uh, like kill. Um, so that's one of his big things that he likes to, to talk about and follow up with his games on. But uh, I know he also doesn't like taking the demo um, in open boards unless it's against elites because it's not really useful if they can just run up a, a mook into the blast and just get rid of it. Um, he takes a second trooper instead, and then that way he can give grenades out to both troopers and get the free elite points on those, uh, especially with the frag and blast. Uh, because an elite point for free on each blast attack is huge, uh, according to him. So yeah, I entirely agree with that. That's one of my that yeah, that pretty much lines up with my outlook on them too. Kasserkin, I love them. Yeah, if they hit on threes, they'd be too good. So yeah, being able that's... to give your two grenades that hit on threes, you know, better elite point uh, management, especially because you're right on the troopers. It's the troopers can spend one elite point for free during any shooting step, yep. right? Yeah, so then you would um, be able to get a bunch of extra on the blast, which would be kind of hot. Yeah, and I know a lot of the times he'll stack that, uh, especially under the dark, because it's so easy. He'll stack that with the... I don't know what the strategic ploy is, but where you put a token down, and if you're making a shot uh, with, like within four inches yeah, it's of like that clear token... Yeah, sweep, I think. Yeah, you get a, a free elite point on anybody who's making that shot. So with the troopers, you're getting two, two free elite points to spend per blast so what's up yeah per blast yeah per blast especially with the frag uh grenade yeah so it makes managing the elite points way easier to do yeah so kind of like especially with like the into the dark stuff if you can see that someone is clustered up and and they think they're safe then you reposition to steal that extra three inches so that they're not safe and then you run into that token and then you hit hit like a, a group that thought they were safe with like a big blast and you've got two free elite points per blast and it's a pretty yep. gnarly combo that I've pulled off a few times. Yeah, there's a lot of games where we would play and I'd look over at his elite point counter and he'd still be at like eight or ten. I'd be like, how? Like we're in the the third turn and he's still got so many elite points to spend. So I definitely I think... I've probably had something like that happen against novitiates too, where I'm like in the middle of turn three, I'm like, ah oh. You still have eight elite points or faith points. It's not going to yeah. go well for me. So, yeah. Like, I think the the hardest counter for Kazakin is if you can kill the leader and or force them to use more elite points than they want to, you know, to try to survive a, you know, a melee attack or something. I think that's where they start to kind of fall apart because hitting on fours naturally isn't the greatest. So they kind of rely on those elite points to make their, their good shots great. Yep, super Which is true. what I found. Yeah, and then uh, despite the fact that everyone says they're a purely shooty team, you really have to plan for a surprising amount of melee, which is great because if you use Fercadia plus one damage, use elite points, it's um, in it a clutch be, yeah, situation, can you can have a like guaranteed 100% yeah. risk-free four damage hit from anyone on the team. Yeah, I've been caught off guard so many times where he will just go... Orcadia, and then fight me, like where I have like he'll fight a melee operative of mine. And I'm like, what are you doing? But he survives because of the five up field of pain, and yeah. it's like it's just it's a crazy turn of events where you don't really expect it. Yeah. Are there any other like niche kind of tactics that you enjoy doing that you want to want to share? You Even know, you've been playing hundred play for a long time. Yeah, that's not that's not Brett's <laughs> secrets, you know. You've been on Blooded for a while. Is there anything that you do that maybe you know Baki doesn't do? Uh, yeah. So I was actually talking to one of my opponents at KTO who had played against, uh, or who like regularly plays against Baki in the area, um, mm -hmm. because he was from the like the Bats area. Okay. Uh, he was a Corsairs player, and I had asked him after the game. I was like, "So what do I do differently that he doesn't?" And he was like, well, for starters, you take, um, like, the Enforcer and the Ogren a lot more. Um, and then, same thing with, uh, at Elvio, I had an opponent who went, uh, played against him with Kroot. And then I played against that same, uh, same opponent. And he was like, yeah, Baki didn't take the Enforcer against the Kroot, or the Ogren. He took, uh, four troopers. 
And that was really interesting because in my mind, the Enforcer is way more useful in a lot more matchups than, you know, people give him credit for. Uh, and I like to have the extra shooting with the Overwatches and stuff like that. So just a little bit different than, I guess, what Baki does because he'll take uh, uh, a lot more troopers more of the time than I do. But Yeah, I mean, he started on veteran guards, so I think he's also very comfortable with the extra mental load for the extra four guys. Um, but, you know, he does take the Enforcer and he will take the Ogren. It just depends on the matchup a lot. So oh, yeah. it might be yeah, that you... And... Maybe you're taking them too often, or maybe he's not taking them enough in some matchups. So it's hard to know. 100%. Yeah, it's it's really hard, especially when there aren't enough players playing them for a good representation, too. Uh, they're still on the lower end, even after KTO and stuff. Um, but yeah, for sure. I mean, I know there there are matchups where I will guarantee take the Enforcer and Ogren, because it's just worth it. Um, but I did... Before KTO, I had never taken... Uh, four and uh, four troopers in any matchup that I had played because I never played against Pathfinders with Blooded and only played against Vetguard once and I wanted to try out the Ogren against them. So it was it was very weird going into that and like my first matchup at KTO was uh, Pathfinders. So I had to try out the four troopers and get used to the playing with GA2 and you know weaker shooting but being able to tie stuff up in in melee a little bit easier. Yeah, I think uh, so, one good thing for when people are trying to learn new teams um, is to try to do things that you're not comfortable with first, because that way you can get a feel for the awkward stuff, because that's the part that you're if you're going to be awkward while learning a team, you might as well be awkward all the way. Yeah, <laughs> at least you can try to get comfortable with the awkward stuff, like yeah. you said. Yeah, because if so. you start comfortable and never try the awkward stuff, then when you need it, because you're, you're like looking at the matchup and you're like, oh, I should probably have four extra dudes if you've never done it even once. It's going to be that much more awkward. Yeah. So, and going into RBDs, it's kind of the same thing. I'm trying to to get a feel for everything before I kind of determine what I want to be bringing against each matchup. So, I have yet the only model I have yet to use is the heavy stubber from RBDs because it's just I don't know when it's when it's useful. <laughs> but you're allowed two gunners or one gunner on R RBDs? Two gun, two gunners. Okay. Yep. So. Most of the time, if you're taking gunners, it's Grenade Launcher and Weber, just because they're the most consistent with damage and movement and all that. But with the heavy gunner, or the heavy stubber, uh, I feel like the only matchup it'd be good against is things with seven wounds that you can be able to just, you know, get a, a heavy bolter shot basically on yeah, um, and guarantee the kill. A very shooting centric matchup like Veteran Guard or. God forbid Pathfinders, but I would assume that you'd probably just want to run shields up against Pathfinders and pray to get into melee, but it sounds rough. Yeah, it's still all a work in progress, honestly, trying to figure that out. So they're still really new. So I can't expect anything to, to be set in stone yet with them. Yeah. Anyways, Jason, you're playing uh, Hand of the Archon right now. Do you got any niche tactics from your couple practice games? You know, I... Do not yet. I am not nearly as practiced as I should be for now. I'm kind of just like trying to get my basics down. Like, who do I want to deploy next to each other? And just all the very basics. Yeah. For anyone listening who hasn't looked at the rules for Hand of the Archon, probably one of the one of the models you're going to be the most afraid of is the one with the poison grenade. Because the poison grenade doesn't require actual line of sight. You can just pick a point on the map and then... Everyone within two inches of it gets the uh, a chance at a debuff. And she can throw it as many times as she wants. So if she runs up to throw the grenade, make sure you are ready to kill her. Because otherwise she's doing it again next turn. And it's not a shooting attack, right? So you can do it from not the a seal? Yeah, it's an yep. action. So it's a Gotta silent out. silent point that is, you know... Yeah, it can be very gross. So everyone be yeah, careful. It's also one of the few things in the game that can injure things that cannot be injured. <laughs> So it can, it's so lethal it can injure custodies and death guard, which is crazy. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I don't think it affects methodical from in intercessors, which is interesting because they don't degrade their ballistic skill, which is separate from not being injured. So they um, would. So I thought that there was an FAQ that came out for them and rust emanations on Gellerpox because rust emanations is 
the same thing. It's injury regardless of any other rules. That said mm -hmm. that uh, the rust emanation still applies, but I could be wrong. I, I'm not entirely sure because I don't play either of those teams. So. Yeah, like it does apply for like slowing them down, but it, but like the ballistic skill isn't modified as a result of injury. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and looking at the FAQ, it says if a rule treats an operative as being injured regardless of any other rules, then methodical chapter tactics does not in ignore the ballistic skill and weapon skill modifiers. Hmm. That's not the okay. way I would have expected that to work. Oh, well, yeah. So it probably is the same thing for the Torment Grenade then. <laughs> yeah, I would assume that oh. the Torment Grenade should be one-to-one -one for this because it's regardless of all the rules. So Yeah, so same wording and everything. So, Which makes it even stronger against Intercession. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Anyways, I think that's the end of our time. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Yes, thank you all for listening. Again, remember to like and subscribe. And uh, if you're listening on a platform that accepts comments, leave a comment. And thanks again, Blaine, for coming by and talking about your local scene, getting stuck on the Adepticon ordering list, and all that <laughs> other stuff. Yeah, I appreciate you guys for having me on. It was a, a great pleasure. And uh, for anybody listening, if I can shout this out, uh, check out our channel, uh, Six Sided Legion, on YouTube. Uh, we just post stuff about Kill Team tournament reviews and uh, battle reports and all such, all, all sorts of things. So.